Okay. So again, let me get refocus again. Okay. So again, each person, the key to us is each person, where Nachman says, study is not the main thing, it's action. So we have to understand, if our study today is not leading to action, then really, it's worthless. That means you could talk about Amuna, you could talk about everything else, but next thing you know, you get an email, you freak out, where's your Amuna? <coughs> then that's that, and there's no action. So study is not the main thing, it's action. Once you convert it to action, that's, re- that's converting a Muna to Betachor, a Muna to trust. And these are ob- obviously right now, we know Abraham Avinu, he got tested 10 times. You're going to get tested in life to prove your loyalty. What was the whole point of the 10 test with Abraham Avinu? Just to prove his loyalty. Was he all in? So we also, I felt like this month I've got tested 10 times. And this is something that, what am, where am I, where am I, what am I doing on my worst days? Am I still praying in the morning? What am I doing on the days that, that life consumes you? Am I still, are you still getting up? That's what you get rewarded and that's what you get tested for. And that's what you have to ask yourself. What do you do on those bad days? Because that's a Muna. A Muna is something at night. It's not in the day. If it was in the day, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be a Muna. So Rav Nachman says here, each person must cast aside all his sophisticated ideas and serve God with simplicity and innocence. If you don't have simplicity and innocence, then what happens? You're going to start questioning things. That's the whole thing. The greatness about, about Judaism, about having a relationship with God, about His Bodhidut, it's all simplicity and innocence. The complications is, is what's killing us today. If you just had simplicity, God, I have a problem, I need help. God, I can't handle my marriage, I need help. God, help me with this. Just the simplicity. That's all you would need. The problem in life is when we question things. When we question things too much, that's doubt. Doubt is the root of Amalek. Why didn't this work out for me? All these things are, are a person. So he's saying here, if a person's deeds should be greater than his wisdom, you want the magic formula for success, your deeds need to be greater than your wisdom. If your wisdom, that means you're very smart, but you're not doing anything, you have a problem. So that's the magic formula, because study is not the main thing, but action. This is actually in Pirkei Avos. Action means, emuna means speaking, speaking, praying. Not just talking about it, doing, doing, committing. The person's committing. Remember, I, I, there, was no, there was this girl the other day, she, she asked me for some dating advice, and I asked her, you know, how is, how is your commitment? When she, she told me nobody's committing to her. Okay, so there's got to be a problem, right? Why wouldn't anybody commit to her? Even she told me that people pay to have a Khan pay so she can go out with her, and nobody's committing to her. She, done, she didn't understand why nobody's committing to her. So I, ask, so I said, she's saying the word commit a thousand times. So I said, let me ask you a question. How's your commitment? Right? What do you do for Hashem? Do you commit anything? No, I, I don't, I'm not into the whole Shabbat thing. Okay, I understand. How about lighting candles? Commit to something. I don't like to commit to a time. I don't want to come and commit to a time. Okay, how about, how about maybe a little kosher? No, it is not, not in my area. No commitment whatsoever. She didn't commit to one thing, so guess what? When she wants people to commit, they don't commit to her. So there's her answer. I said, you're, you have a commitment issue. It's not the way you look. It's not the way you speak. It's that you're not committing down here. Upstairs, you're not committing for you. It's the whole thing. So I said, start committing to something. Because when you commit, you go all in. I can't tell you the difference between people who are succeeding and people not succeeding is people that go all in. If you go all in, you're going to win. If you don't go all in, you're not committing. And today, this is the issues that we have. So when she starts committing to things, Upstairs they commit to her. That's why a person should make God's will his will, so God, so people's will will be his will. See, that's the, that's the, all I heard in two minute conversation was the word commitment, and she did not commit to anything. So that's something we have to ask ourselves. Before we, we question the world on everything, and obviously we question everything, first ask yourself, what, how is your commitment first? How is your commitment? That's a good question. Because I guarantee you, there's usually a little hole in the commitment. And, I get, and that's why I said specifically in, in, the dating, in the dating class that I said, you know, when a person, you know, a person says, you know, once I get married, I'll keep Shabbat. Once. Once this happens. So I said, why don't you do it now? If you believe in it, do it now. Why are you waiting for something? So when a person, just because of a mitzvah, see, the law of attraction for Judaism could work very, it works very differently. It works if a person yearns. If he has such a desire for a specific mitzvah, a person could say, you know, when I'm going to get married, I'm going to keep Shabbat. If he starts keeping Shabbat now, he can yearn to get the marriage partner. That's the intensity. You see, you can use your mind instead of using the imagination 
of horror films, use your imagination for something very good. So this is something I've definitely done with charity, specific deals. I said, wow, I would love to make this deal because if I can make this deal, I can give this amount of organization, to this amount of money to this organization. Sometimes I've even wrote, I wrote, even wrote a check out for that specific amount and I yearned for it and guess what? The deal came through and the money came through. That's the difference between praying, God make me rich and please I want to give this specific amount to charity. So next thing you know, you're getting, you're, getting, you're getting the deal, not because of your marriage, you're getting it because of the charity. So that's the way we're able to use yearning, which is, which is what Nachman's going to say today. What are you yearning for? That means, you should, if a person can't give tzedakah, and we already know the power of tzedakah, he should cry out to God, God, how come I cannot give tzedakah? How can I? That's a good complaint. That's not a complaint. Why is it, I, I have no money for this, I have no money for that, I have no money. Hashem, if you told us, you told us how great the value of tzedakah is, why are you taking the mitzvah away from me? Well, that's a good argument. So next thing you know, it can, your, your mazak can change just because of yearning for something else. This I use all the time, and it works 100% of the time. Go for the mitzvah, but at, at the end of the day, you're going to get what you want. Because it, it looks complete, it, it's a, it's a, that's how you convince God. One part of His bodhidut, if you start building a relationship with God, you'll start talking differently. You'll start arguing with you. You're allowed to argue in a, in a way to, to have Him convince you. God doesn't want a, a, a snail, help me, help me, help me. He doesn't want a snail talking to Him. He wants somebody with a little bit of a heart, a little sincerity, a little action. First, you have to sell yourself first. First, you have to sell yourself. What is that? Believing it. And then you can sell Hashem. So why, why do we pay such a big price for not having confidence? Because you, don't even, you can't even sell yourself. If I can't sell myself, how can I sell Hashem? It doesn't work. You understand? So believing it is selling myself first. Why do I merit this mitzvah of charity? Why do I merit to get married? Hashem, you created the mitzvah of Puravu. How come I can't fulfill it? That's a different way of asking. Give me my soulmate. Okay, wonderful. Like everybody else is praying that way. You want a challenge. Your prayer has to be a form of a challenge. It can't just be uh, saying the same thing. Okay, that's when a person, when a person has dot, when he comes to a class, he starts praying differently. That means, when a person starts praying differently, starts getting some knowledge of Torah, all of a sudden your prayer automatically gets better. So your prayer enhances your, your Torah study, enhances the person's learning. So that's why when a person has mercy for himself, guess what happens? Hashem has mercy for him. So this is a way I want you to start using the power of desire. Desire is, is, is it comes from the level of Keter. Keter is, comes from the will of will. It's the highest energy possible. That means you could be failing a hundred times, but as long as you keep on desiring it, you're going to get it. Because every desire, what happens when a person desires something? His soul actually creates a new soul and he actually becomes into that. Now, you can't tell me I'm desiring to get married and you're dating the wrong people. That means you're not really desiring. You're playing games with yourself. So if you're really desiring, that means first you cut the weeds of your life. Then I do my desire. It can't be a, a fake desire. I want to go on a diet and you're eating, you know, eating garbage. That's not desire. Okay, so let's use the power of desire which comes from the energy of Keter. Which comes from the energy of Keter. So basically, what we're trying to say here, start doing a lot more than you're speaking. Get, do more than you get paid for. You know, one, one person always told my employees, if you want to get a raise, do more than you get paid for. Same thing spiritually. Start doing a little bit more than you get paid for. Sometimes you might have to give up some sleep. But people right now, they don't even want to give, a, they don't even want to give up 10 minutes of sleep. So what do, you, what do you want? There's no grind anymore. There's no life for us. That's a problem, because if we're not growing in our life, we're shrinking. If we're shrinking, then obviously we get, we get stuck in negative thought patterns. Remember the two things that got the Jews out of Egypt. One thing, they had to believe at first that they were going to get out of Egypt. And the second thing is, they had to want it. They had to have desire. So desire and amuna, they both work with each other. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, how is my desire? How is my desire lately? Okay, and that will actually break. Okay, so let's get to the main, main, main topic of the class, now that the cameras are working, right? Okay, see, we didn't pray for the cameras to work. We, we, we always assume that they're going to work, but we have to pray for them. Next time, believe me, after this, we'll, we'll start praying for them. Okay, so remember, guys, it's very important. We have to master consistency. Consistency is desire. That means if a person wants something, he goes all in. All in. 
And that's the difference between having major success and having so-so success. Because a person that has desire doesn't quit. He desires, if he gets caught in an obstacle, you know what he does? He gets, he gets even more. Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 66 that the only purpose of your obstacles is so you can build desire. That's the only reason. The only reason why people have obstacles today is because God wants more of a push from you. He wants more of a push from you. If, you, if you're having a, a tough time with, with, with tefillah, if you're having a tough time with anything, it's all to build your desire, and that's the relationship that we're going for. That's why, remember guys, if, if we don't have a, a relationship, then it's all gone. Then any bad day can, can knock you out. Okay, lesson 133. Okay, lesson 133 talks about that how come it's so, it's so difficult for people today to have, a, to have the light. How come one guy all of a sudden could have so much light and the other guy he seems like he can't even, he, he's trying to jump start the cables, he can't even get the car running. What's the difference between one to the other? Okay, so he's saying something very, very beautiful, and this is a great ana analogy for us. He's saying here that the sun radiates its place constantly. It's not working. See, he said 10,000 hits. There you go. Okay. That's what happens. You see, you gotta, you gotta be careful with numbers. Don't say numbers in life. Don't, don't, never count numbers, never count. It's never good to say numbers, because when you give numbers, you give an eye to something. Even, I made this amount of money. Don't give the amount of numbers. When you give a number, it gives an eye. So we're not allowed to count people. That's specifically what we don't count. Don't give numbers. I went on 24 dates. Don't give numbers. <laughs> so, he's saying the sun itself radiates in a place consistently. Right? The sun is always shining. We agree. The sun is always shining. What's the obstacle that's preventing the sun from reaching the people? It's the earth. Correct? What's the, what's the obstacle? He's saying here, whether in the morning or in the day, the obstacle is only because of the earth which obstructs the people from seeing the sun. This is why the light does not spread constantly. So what we're saying here, the same is true of the teachings of, for example, the Torah. The Torah has tremendous light. It can guard our emotions. It can be successful. I've used in my, my, my businesses, I would say 99% of the advice I've used has been from Torah to handle my businesses. It has very rarely used from other kinds of sources. It's used from, from Ram Nachman's teachings, how to deal with anger, how to deal with employees, how to deal with management. It's all Torah based. It's not based on other things. He's saying the same is true of, of a tzaddik. It's The sun is always shining, but what's the problem? The problem is the receiver. Right? What does the earth do? The earth obstructs the sun's vision. So we, according to us, we have to understand, we also have that obstruction. And he says, in other words, the people, the reason why people can't see the light of the Torah is because of the earth that's blocking this light from coming to us. It's not, a person should never say, uh, I have no mazal, uh, I don't have the ability, we'll just, we'll just do it here, because this is going to be... A person should never say, I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have the right mazal, I don't have the right this. A person should always say to himself, something is blocking my light. The difference between saying, I have mazal, and I don't have mazal, that means, okay, this is my life. When I say, I don't have mazal, what do I do? My actions are going to say, why, why put in an effort? I don't have mazal anyway. You know what people say? I was born with, with, with my mazal's terrible. When you say that, what does that mean? That means your actions, that means I'm not going to do anything. That's it. I'm going to sit and just be a victim. So we have to understand, anytime you're getting an obstruction of light, it's because we are the receiver. And the receiver has the issue, not the sun. Very important concept. And he's saying here, why? Because if we realize we're too submerged to this world, if we're running constantly after money, what do we do? We're creating this, this blockage of light. And what happens? I have a lot of friends, maybe three or four got arrested in one month, running after money, no, shall, no, no, not getting married, they're in the wrong deal, here you go, they're all facing jail sentences. This is what happens. This is what happens. Because it says, the Gemara says, one who, lives without a, one who lives without a wife, lives without a wall. Very simple. If you don't live, that's why I talk to the guys, guys, you got to get your act together. Because you're going to fall. You're going to fall to the wrong girl, you're going to fall to this. We know intermarriage rates are 60% nowadays. 60%? This is what happened. The guy starts from from birth, he, he has no muna, he drops the religion, next thing you know he's intermarried. This is the numbers. Look at the, look at the statistics. So if you don't teach a muna to people, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Look at the numbers. It, shouldn't, it doesn't bother a person to get intermarried? It doesn't bother him? He has no sensitivity, he doesn't really care. Because he's, he doesn't see the light from the Torah. So what is he saying here? Something very beautiful. 
And he's saying the Torah is so great, however, it's one's vision that prevents it from seeing it. How? It's very simple. If I take a quarter and put it in front, and this is the example that Rabbi Nachman brings. If I put a quarter in front of a mountain, what do you think you're going to see? The quarter. The quarter. How could it be possible for you to see a little coin and the mountain is 60,000 times bigger, but all we see is a little coin? How could that be possible? How is that physically possible? But that's what happens to us today. Sometimes we get caught in a little coin that won't allow you to see the Torah, that won't allow you to see the light of spirituality. How many people do we know like this? It's a little coin. And you would say, it's impossible. Look at the mountain above you. Look at the mountain. But what happens, the majority of depression comes today, is all, it's, it's an expectation equation. That means, unfortunately, some of our expectations have led us to, to where we are today. So, like I said, I told people very simple. And I could say 99% of people that have a problem with arrogance and, and, and the Brit, it's all based on a problem with expectation. It all starts with expectations. Now, what is the situation with expectations? It's very simple. Let's say you're supposed to make in Shemayim $500,000 this year. Okay? Let's say that's your number. Okay? You expected, one guy says, you know what, if I make $300,000 this year, I'll be happy. He makes $500,000. He's walking around happy, thank you Hashem, BH, whatever he's doing in his life. The other guy says, you know what, this year I should make a million dollars this year. He makes $500,000. Both of these guys made $500,000. One guy wants to jump off a building, another guy is super happy. Where is the problem here? Where's the problem? There's the equation. Our expectations sometimes are destroying us. And I said, I told this guy, let me ask you a question. Maybe you're going to make it next year, but why do you think this specific year you have to make that specific amount? You're almost marrying a number. Why do you have to make this year? Because I made it last year. Who says you're going to make it this year? Look how life changes. Look at this is the waves of life. So what happens? You're walking around depressed. You're walking around, you're taking out, you became an alcoholic because of your ego through an expectation? So what does that say about the person? So the, we have to have realistic expectations. So whenever I tell people, whenever your expectations are, are, are not coming in, change your story. Like I had a rehab business, I think 14 rehabs closed this year. What did we do? I said, wow, I have to start rebuilding from the ground up. I have to work on the foundation. This year is not about profit, this year is about foundation. So what happens is, if I would have focused on the expectation, I would have become very depressed. And I said, look, what's going on? This is not happening, that's not happening. So we have to realize sometimes in our life, it's our expectations which is the form of the ego. I'm not saying not to have goals, but who says you're not going to make it this year, maybe you'll make it next year. When is Hashem going to decide to bless you? And if you get the wrong number at the wrong time, there you go. So what happens? You're going to drop spirituality, you're going to drop Hashem, you're going to drop everything just because of a fantasy expectation that you decided. Very simple. I saw this the other day, I, told, I told, gave this example in drug rehab. This guy is a football player, a basketball player, he tried out for two teams, he, almost, he tried to kill himself because he says, I'm a failure. Okay, so I told him, who says you didn't have to try out four times? Who, where is this, who, who's coming up with the numbers here? You, Hashem, who's coming up with the numbers? So he almost ki killed himself because he, he, two times meant for him a failure. But it could have been five times he had to try out and he would have gotten to the team. What's his name? Jack Ma. He didn't even get a job at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Do you understand? Jack Ma, which is the owner of Alibaba, which is a $7 billion company, he says there were 25 interviews for, for Kentucky Fried Chicken in China and they hired 24 people. They didn't hire him. Because God didn't want him to be working as, as selling chicken in China. And look where he is today. But I'm just trying to tell you, he tried, to, he tried for Harvard 10 times, he didn't get it. He says now he teaches in Harvard. So we don't, we don't understand, we don't understand. J.K. Rawlings, 13 times she tries the, the Harry Potter book. I think she's the richest lady in, in, in London today. J.K. Rowling. What happens? The 13th time, that's when it's the same. Chicken soup for the soul. They went to 134 editors. Before they said, you know what, this is a bunch of chicken soup, this garbage. One guy said, you know what, I like the story. They sell a billion, they sell a billion dollars in, in books. So we don't, we, the, the, a person who's humble, you know what he does? He doesn't give up. He continues and he continues because he says the obstacle must be there for my desire. 
The person who's not humble says, oh, two times I'm done. Three times I'm done. It's not meant to be. So I, I, I'm questioning sometimes, unfortunately, the character of the people. The character of the people are, is weak. And just because you fail two times, that doesn't mean you're a failure. You, you, you learned. You didn't, you're not a failure. If you say, I'm a failure, then what do you say? Life is hopeless. And there goes your... And then you're going to escape to whatever you're going to escape in our life. Even marriages. I got divorced one time. Failed marriage, second time it's gone great. Life happens. But if I say I'm a failure, then all of a sudden I can influence the people I meet, etc. So we, we, it's very important that this is part of our life. Why do these things happen to us? To humble us. Because we realize, you know, we have, we have skeletons in our closet. If we thought we were so great, then we would walk differently. That's why the Gemara says that the, the, we don't point a king without a blemished background. Every king has to have a blemished background because to make sure, by the way, remember where you came from before you get a little haughty. That's the same thing today with us. Any kind of leadership, any kind of anything, there's always a little bit of a blemished background so a person stays humble and stays calm. So Rabbi Nachman says here that the problem is here is the small coin in front of our eyes. Now this doesn't have to be a coin, it could be an expectation, it could be uh, an addiction. This is stopping you from seeing the big, big, big mountain. Once I realized that, that I realized my expectations are getting me into problems. Because I, 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 I realized that my mood was determined upon the amount of money I made in a day. I said, this is not good. Because what happens if I don't make money, then my shalom bai goes to the, to the garbage. How do you fix that? How do you fix that? That means if my mood is determined by the money I make, it's going to come home, I'm going to sit there and, and, and give it to my wife, and next thing you know, I got a problem. So that's an expectation problem. And that comes from the ego. We're not supposed to have, our problem today is we want everything fast. And, we, and how do we know this? From Hor. Hor sacrificed himself for the Beit HaMikdash, for the ego. They killed him. What happened? His son, his son comes, they figure, you know what, look at your father's sacrifice. What did his son get? His son didn't get nothing. But you know who got it? His grandson. His grandson was Betzalel, and he built the Beit HaMikdash. So, who decides which one is going to get blessed? So we have to realize that. That any time that little arrogance comes, we have to realize it's maybe our expectations. We have to, we have to monitor our expectations. Because that's the difference between anger and having life is your expectations, which all come from, obviously, the ego. So when you go to a marriage to give, with no expectations, you're going to be happy a thousand percent. If you go to a marriage to take, with all your expectations, you're going to go be very miserable. That's the formula. It's an expectation issue. We, when you're always focused on giving, you're going to get. But if you're, oh, he's not doing this for me, she's not doing that for me, ba 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 Next thing you know, your expectations are not fulfilled, and be, you became a taker, and then what happens? There's the fight. So you always want to focus on giving. When a person gives unconditionally, what, what doesn't Hashem give unconditionally? We have to do the same thing. Okay? So that's the, that's the little coin that we have that's blocking the mountain. It's that exact thing. It's the, it's the little quarter. And he gives a beautiful example here that it's going to be, a, he, he gives an example of a guy loading copper in his life, and all of a sudden, he sees a little bit of gold. He sees one gold nugget. You know what's the, what's the guy going to do? He's going to drop the copper and go for the gold. The gold is the spirituality. The copper is all the expectations. So you think you, have, you saw the light. It's not light. Because unfortunately, Rav Nachman says sometimes, a, a person gives, they give money to a person who's a rasha, so he can tra entrap other people and they can fall for the test. I've seen this all the time. That's why I tell people, stay in your lane. When you stay in your lane, you don't care what the rest of the world is doing. You stay in your lane, you focus on the blessing that you have. If you're sitting there comparing to other people, he made, she didn't, blah, blah, blah. Anytime I get a phone call, I don't understand why everybody's life is easier and not mine. There's your problem. I said, you gotta call me back when you're in your lane. When you, when you get in your lane, then we'll have a conversation. Right now I can't help you because you're not in your lane. Bottom line, when you're not in your lane, you, you're never gonna succeed. Lesson 68. This is one of the game-breaking Torahs that you should, that if you just came for this one, this is probably one of my favorite Torahs that Rav Nachman has. And he's saying here that, especially if you're in business, especially if you're Moroccan. Okay, 
it says here, all souls desire and hunger and, 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 and are hungry after money. Why are all souls are hungry after money? It's because money comes from a very, very high place. Money comes from the same place as your soul. So it's natural for you, it's natural for a woman to go to seek a husband that's going to complete her life. So she needs to make sure that he, is, he, he, he has a, makes a living because otherwise she feels a lack. You understand? Because she's, she's trying to connect to his soul. But if the husband is not, doesn't have the, not saying money, but it's lacking light. So when she sees a guy that's comfortable, she really feels her soul is, is, is light. So it's not like she's after money, she's after a guy to complete the light. It's, it's, it's a natural response. A woman seeks safety. But it's really, the spiritual source of it is that their soul wants to be complete. And unfortunately, the soul has to be complete through money. He says, the origin of money is very, very, very high. It's very, very high. The problem is when people have a lack of money, what they do when they have a lack of money. When they go crazy. It's not the money itself that's a problem. It's when you lack it, then you do crazy things. That's what Rabbi Rosenthal, Rosenthal says. When you, when you lack the money, then you go crazy. But the source of money itself comes from a very, very, very high place in Shemaim. And that's why the rabbis would honor the rich. Because they, that person has a very, very high soul. Okay? And he says, why? Here he's saying here, undoubtedly the aspect of holiness is the aspect of holy influx. But afterwards, the process of devolving, all of a sudden, the actual shefa becomes money. But it all comes from the left side. The right side is chesed, in Kabbalah 101, the right side represents chesed, the right represents victory, the left side represents gevura, bina. Bina means understanding. If a person has to do Teshuvah today, he has to go do Teshuvah in the level of Bina. Why Bina? It's because your understanding was off. So Bina represents the mother. Chochmah, which is thought, represents the father. So when a kid, when a kid soils his diapers, where is he going to? He's going to his mother to clean him up. So that's what Bina represents a person doing Teshuvah. So he's saying here the origin of money is very, very, very high. So we shouldn't run after money, but we should run after the, the source of money, which comes from a very, 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 very high place in Shemaim. Okay? And he's saying, no, it would be right for all the Jews to have money. However, there is one trait that causes them to forfeit and lose it. There's one trait that you have to be very, very careful with. That again, why do we speak so much about the wonderful emotions? Because some people are getting knocked out on this one. And look what he says. This is the despicable evil trait from which it's very difficult to be rescued. Even if a person wants to go free from it, particularly if you're not spending time on yourself and working on yourself, you're going to get caught up on this one. He's saying, so as not to lose the money, this evil trait overwhelms him. Sometimes the guy is born, he's got DNA of angry parents, whatever it is. He says, this evil trait is called anger. Anger. The one thing, if you want to lose money quickly, just get angry. That's the fastest way of getting, losing money. Why? Because anger is gavura. Money comes from the left source. So they both come from the left side. And he's saying here, because the root of the money devolves exactly with the same source as anger. Now, therefore, even when the, when the Satan sees a person having a flow of blessing, devolving down for a person, so that he might have money, he arranges for him to get angry. Specifically, the most stupidest things, if you realize what you went down for, you probably went down, one time I went down almost for a tortilla. Another guy goes down for the stupidest, stupidest things. But realize that has nothing to do with the people. It's, the, it's specifically the Satan does not want you to get a source of this blessing. So he arranges for the person to get <coughs> angry. Now, if you're an angry person, you probably have Shalom Bai problems, and you probably have money problems. Why? Because anger is, is not only that, but you lose your soul. Anger is one thing that you lose your soul. That means you lose your soul. That's why the soul, money, the wife, it's all connected. By a guy that gets angry, what's the number one problem in Shalom Bayit? A person doesn't have self-control. You lose self-control, all of a sudden you become a threat to your wife, you become a threat, and next thing you know, what's he going to do next? He threw a tomato at me. What's he going to throw tomorrow at me? I heard a guy, he threw an orange at his wife. He's still paying the price. Till today. 
But this is what happens. When you lose it one time, a person can get angry. Remember, it also has a five hour effect on your immune system. Anger. That means it takes you four to five hours to recover. For your body to recover. God forbid, if it does constantly, then it becomes, anger is, is, is then you have a problem in your liver. And that's why alcoholics, liver, it's all connected. All, most alcoholics have liver problems. But it's all coming from, what is anger? I don't like the way things are going right now. It's the ultimate source of the ego. It also comes from fear, anger. Because when a person gets angry, he really has a fear of something. So again, no amuna, anger, you lose the money, shalom bayit, you lose self-control. You know what, what, what the Gemara says? Who's, who's a person who's strong? A person that has self-control. That's the magic weapon. That's the magic weapon. It's not about a guy lifting 450 pounds. It's the guy that can hold himself back right when he's going to give the you-know-what to the guy. If he can turn that, that anger, because remember, one of the things we have to sanctify is our nose. Correct? My nose, if I get angry, what do I do? Right? The nose, instead of breathing, what are you doing? You're giving it out. Like that little cartoon we see. So breathing represents patience. That means I have patience, I have a muna. I don't have patience, I have anger. So you get either everything or you get nothing. That means you shouldn't be calling and asking where my parnas is down. If, if you have a big anger issue, you need to fix your anger before you even question your, your parnasa. These are two things. A person, not ha a person having anger and a person having a, a, a pigam in the brit. If a person spilling the seed, don't even bother questioning your parnasa until you get a grip on those two. Otherwise, you're not even hitting the right target. Why? Because the word lot means a curse. Same word as tal means blessing. Either you're getting tal, you're getting blessing, or you're getting lot. Now, why, why should life be so hard? Why do I have to go through anger tests in order for me to receive? Because you know what? That's the way the world is created. Because the weak, get, get the weak become weeds and they get shifted out in life. And that's what most problems are, especially, God forbid, if the anger is suppressed. That means, what is the number, one of the number one causes of cancer is God forbid today? Suppressed emotions, suppressed anger towards somebody. Why? Because you don't, you, you don't agree what happened to them. So what do we have to do? We have to forgive. When you forgive, you let go. And what happens? You start feeling better. But when, you, when a person has anger inside of him, it's the ultimate sign of arrogance and it's the ultimate sign of no amuna. You're not going to get any light from that. So that's why I don't, I, if we don't have the education, so now you have to speak. One of the segulas, the Ramban says, speak very calmly. I have specific people I deal with. I said, we need to lower the volume three. Because the way you're talking, it's already going from blah, blah, blah. Uh, you need to lower the volume. You need to go in, you need to breathe. Because if you're one of my partners, you're costing me money. What are you getting angry about every little thing in life? You think you're going to live forever? No, you're not going to live forever. You can't get angry about everything. So that's why he's saying the rich man's wealth is his stronghold. The word chema is the same word as choma. It means a wall. Either the wall, if a guy has a nice house, he has a big wall protecting him. If he doesn't have a big, uh, what happens? The wall breaks. Then everything comes in. So you have to beg God to help you with anger. Now, one of the ways is managing emotions. How to save yourself from anger. Manage your emotions. Because your emotions tell you, I deserve this when you, when you don't get what you want. What are you going to do? You're going to scream. You're going to scream. And you lose your soul. That means, I know religious people, they got the whole outfit on, this, 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 and they're screaming all the time. They don't even have a, a Jewish soul anymore. Finished. They got exchanged. Person that gets angry constantly loses his soul. It's, it's, the Gemara says it's idol worshipping. You might as well go to Bali and, 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 and go on those resorts. That's what it is. So without the Midot, if a person doesn't work on his Midot, he's a, he's, it's like a pig with a nose hair. With a golden, golden, golden nose. That's why Rav Nachman's whole thing is, if you have a midara, if a person has a negative trait, he has to spend 30 minutes a day just talking about that one until it's completely obliterated. It's completely put to nothing. Why? Because that's the shadow. That means that's the light that's not coming to, that's hitting us. Why? Because of our midot. That means Torah without midot, 
worthless. I can put it toward a donkey. What's the difference? So when we don't work on ourselves, when a person at least says, Hashem, I got angry every day this week. I have no control over myself. So what does he need to do? He needs to humble himself. He needs to ask God for help. So, I hate to say it, but this is one. It's got to go. That's connected to money. That's connected to spirituality. That's connected to everything. And that's why when the, the same word as tariff means a person's substance, it's also the, the opposite is, is torif. Same word means he tears his soul to anger. So, now we understand. Now, why do we need, why is it so important with this whole thing, the situation we speak about with marriage? It's because also the Gemara says, the wife is compared to a wall. Anytime you have a wall, you're settled. You've settled mine. I have a wall. I'm settled. If I don't have a wall, then what's going to happen? I'm going to be an emotional wreck. Okay? That's why it says, our sages says, one who lives without a life lives without a wall. Why do I encourage so many people? You got to get married. You got to get married. Because the way you're going, you're just going to fall. There's, you're not going to make it. You got to get married. Why do I, I'm yelling at the guys all the time. Because without this, without the wall, the Gemara says you're going to fall. And then next thing you know, 40, 50, not married, and there goes, there goes your whole life. And you, and you never become your potential. And what is he saying here? Without wealth. The wall represents wealth. So now we know that the word wall means wealth, and, wall, and it also comes from the wife. So, now where are we getting to this? What's required? Humility. Without humility, a person who is not one of the reasons a person doesn't want to get married is because he's not humble. He's not humble. He thinks he can always get better, I can always get better, I can always get better. So what happens once he wants to settle down and find the right girl, you know what's going to happen? Because you waited all this time, I'm going to make you wait. Because your zivug was waiting for you. But you didn't pick up the ticket. So what happens? You decided to fool around. And the more you fool around, guess what happens? The more you attract the wrong soulmate. Lesson 67, Ram Nachman says that a person can actually lose his soulmate. That means if a guy's single, that means the wife that's supposed to be for me, with the amount of kids, I can actually lose my soulmate if, because of a pigab in the Brits. So, you gotta understand, I'm gonna lose my soulmate just because I wanna fool around? Now you gotta start thinking a little bit. You gotta make a business decision, am I doing the right things? That's the only way you're gonna tell guys to get married. If you tell them, yeah, it's nice to get married, to settle down, but if you're gonna tell them that it's gonna hit them in their pocket, where do I sign? It's, if you don't talk about pockets, if you don't talk about money with guys, there's no leverage. Why wouldn't he continue to fool around? Most of my friends says, why should I marry a Jewish girl? The other girls are so much easier for me, they don't complain, they don't bother me. Because then you want to marry a cheerleader. A cheerleader is not going to get you, she's going to say, yeah, 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 you're great. Uh, you need a coach. A coach is going to tell you where to go, what you need to do, where your weaknesses are. A coach makes you who you are today. But you want to marry a cheerleader all your life? Where's, where's that going to get you? She's never going to tell you you did anything wrong, so you're going to be, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not, that's not a challenge in life. Challenge comes in through a person getting, marrying a coach. But the problem is sometimes the coach is a little tough. <laughs> but technically she's your coach. She's there to protect you. Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 69 that also she's born with intuition. And he compares it to when a woman sees that somebody, it's, this is better than, than buying insurance. Because she's saying when somebody comes to a, a person, for example, if a person's married, and somebody tries to rob him, not that there's anybody out there like that, or somebody that wants to invest with her husband, what does the wife say? That guy I don't like. Don't, this guy, stay away from him. How come, what is she, she's prejudiced? How does she know anything about them? So what does the guy say? What do you know about this guy? You don't even know what you're talking about. I said the same thing also, until I learned the lesson. Until I learned this lesson 69. Because the woman, all of a sudden, she sees that somebody wants to go take her light. What happens? She shrivels up and she panics because she's also getting robbed. You understand? So what does she do? She lashes out at the husband. Don't do business with that guy. So this is the connect. This is why you need you need to find the right girl because you have the best alarm system in the world. You have. A, <laughs> you're gonna find out who's trying to rob you. I promise you. I wish I could joke about this. It's hundred percent accurate. Your wife is your antenna. She's your intuition. So she will protect you from people trying to come and get her light. 
I hate to tell you, so when a person doesn't understand, he doesn't have the dot, what's going to happen? He's going to suffer. When we don't have the dot, we don't understand the essence of the wife, we don't understand why God is so particular about this, we lose. And what do we do? Oh, the Torah doesn't work for me. That's why without dot, without, why do we do these classes? Because without dot, what do you have? You don't have much. So now we know the connection between wife, wealth, wall, she'll control you, she'll make sure you're, you're protected, and she'll be your best security system. That's why a woman, a person has to, the Gemara says, if a person has a wife, he should bend down and listen to her. Why does he say, why is the Gemara telling you? Bend down, because she's telling you what the problem is. Now, what is it? Sometimes if a person's ego says, what do you know about anything? He screams back. You know what happens? He gets nothing. He gets nothing. So this is, again, unfortunately, a lot of this has to do with arrogance. Because that's why, I say, that's why the Gemara says that when a person goes into another person's business, it's like, it's, like taking, it's like robbing your children. Because the children come from the light of the soul. That means anybody that comes and tries to rob a person's profession, it's like sleeping with his wife. Because he's taking the light of his wife. So now that's what we have to understand that you're never, a person is never going to be his potential in his life without these aspects. Rabbi Nachman, we'll do one more Torah, and then I had two more things, but it's going to go too long. One more, one more, we'll do one more Torah. And that's why he's saying here that the majority of people, they fall from the level spiritually if they're just chasing the money. So if we're not, if we're not listening to the, our, our soul, which is our wife, then what are we doing? We're doing what we want. Then what happens? We learn, we learn the hard way. And then you start pursuing more and more and more and more, and then that's going to drop you from your spiritual level. You see, it's all connected. God, God created the Torah to help you, not to kill you. Believe it or not. Shabbat, spirituality, all this is supposed to revive your soul. That means you should be refreshed. After a person prays, he should walk out of there refreshed. After you learn, you should walk out of your refresh. If it's not refreshing you, then you're doing something wrong. If the Torah is heavy for you, something is wrong. That means something's wrong in the, one of your lungs, because the oxygen. Remember, what is the Torah? The only way a person today, the, the, the Zohar says, that if it wasn't for the lobes of the lungs, a person's heart would consume him. What does that mean? That means a person has a heart. The heart is the seed of the emotions. The heart is the seed of all the passions. In between the heart and the brain, your brain is, is neshama, is neshima, means the breath, it's like a lamp, lit. So what's blocking, what's between both is the lungs. That means if my brain is lit with a candle, wonderful. I have contemplation, I have focus, I have direction, I can do what I know I need to do. But what happens if the heart doesn't get cooled off by the, by the lungs? The lungs, there's five lungs represent the five books of the Torah. If it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for the lobes of the lung, the Zohar says, the heart would consume you, would lead you to go nuts. So, the Torah, what it does, the Torah does, it, it keeps you calm. It humbles you. So when a person is humble, what happens? All of a sudden, he gets contemplation. If his, if his emotions are not getting cooled off spiritually, by, by the heart, by the, by the lungs, which represents spirituality, then what happens? The heart consumes the brain and shuts off the lamp. So, Reb Nachman says in 166, how are you able to have both wealth and how are you able to have both spirituality at the same time? How, what's the magic formula he's saying here? How do we know this? Because the Gemara says that when a person wants to pray, the Magus says the two can't stand for it. That means one who wants to become wise, he has to face south in his prayers. When a person prays, he wants to become wise, he should face to the south. If he wants to become wealthy, he has to face the north. You see some guys are shifting completely like this when they pray. Some guys are that way. So, he's saying here, we therefore find that it's, impo it's, it's almost impossible for the, for the two to stand. How can, I, I can have, how can I have wealth and the same thing at the same time? The exception to this is the, it's the concept of humility. That means if a person's humble, he's nothing. He's not standing to the right or he's not standing to the left. He's nowhere. That means when a person makes himself humble, he can get both of these aspects. He can have the wealth that doesn't kill him, and he can have the spirituality that enlightens him. How? Only through humility. So when a person has these both things, then a person gets the ability to have both. 
That's why through humility, that means humility means no anger. The humility means asking Hashem for me to change. So if we have an anger problem, if we have a Pigama Brit problem, people have them all the time. But if you're not asking God for help, to help you fight this, then really you're not showing humility. You, you say you can do it by yourself. So when a person says he could do something by itself, he's going to lose. Because the Gemara says, I invented the Satan, I invented the Eight Saharam, and, I, and if it wasn't for my help, the people would never, would never have a shot of winning. So already you're, 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 the odds are against you. That means if you don't ask for help, you're almost guaranteed to lose. And he says, what's the magic potion? Torah. But obviously Torah with the heart. All right? That's today's class. Thank you.